Hey, Todd Alt here. I'm so happy to present you this keynote speaker from our Risk On Business Conference. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. This next person who's gonna come on, she's fighting to educate people uh, in the digital space. She's the CEO of the first digital chamber of commerce. She's also worked for a hedge fund, very well thought of in the community. Let's, do we have a video for her, I hope? That's me taking a chance there. CEO and founder of Digital Chamber of Commerce, Piri Ann Bourne. Wow. Up to you. So we're gonna do a little uh, q and I guess they tempered it down a little bit, huh? Okay. No, no, I'm talking about the hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were in makeup together and they were doing like this vixen look and I you was like, seen him. the crowd's gonna love this. <laughs> um, I thought maybe you could explain to Digital Chamber of Commerce to everybody. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I'm the founder and the CEO of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we're a, a, a nonprofit trade association based in Washington, D.C. Um, so just uh, how we came to be, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about my background. So my background's in public policy. Um, I grew up in Florida. I'm from Lakeland, Florida, small town in central Florida. I, I studied economics at the University of Florida during the global financial crisis. Um, which impacted everybody I knew, because the financial crisis was essentially the housing market blowing up, which was essentially the state of Florida, which was my my friends, my family, my community. Didn't affect me at all. Great. Kidding, right? <laughs> no, that was a that was a traumatic time. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so I was in college studying economics, and um, really none of my professors could explain what was happening in the economy. And uh, a few of my friends, we went on kind of our own independent study just to understand, like, what is happening in the economy? How does the financial system really work? What is money? How is the monetary system structured? And the things that we learned were um, quite frightening. So at a young age, I dedicated my career to fight for a better economic future. I really just didn't feel like the financial system that we lived in represented the values that I was brought up in. So went to DC, um, did my internship at the White House, went to Capitol Hill, and I learned about Bitcoin when I was working on the Hill. Um, and that was in 2011 timeframe, so really early days. Uh, and I studied this on my own, watching YouTube videos, because like back then there really was not a lot of information to learn about this technology. Um, I, I you know, watched videos, listened to technologists speak, and eventually I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin is the most important technology I will see in my entire, in, in my lifetime. And um, that this is how we address the systemic issues in our financial and our monetary system. So for the public policies that I was fighting for on Capitol Hill, like a more sound monetary system, greater financial inclusion, more stability in our financial system, I realized that if this technology has the opportunity to really grow, and be implemented at a mass scale, it could address all these things that I was had been fighting for for years. So we started the Chamber of Digital Commerce in 2014 to work with our public policymakers to educate them on the importance of this technology and to help guide them in the regulatory process. When the Chinese banned Bitcoin for the 13th time yeah. <laughs> uh, last March or whenever it was, uh, that's the time that they seemed like they really did it, right? Sure. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, like, since you've been there since the beginning, how much real rumblings were there about people wanting to ban it in the U.S.? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So in 2013, so we founded the chamber in 2014. So 2013 was really the idea that we conceptualized, you know, why we wanted to have a trade association in our nation's capital. So 2013, I call that like the breakout year for Bitcoin. So before this, before 2013, it hadn't... Bitcoin was still like a very unknown technology. So there were three things that happened that year. The first is that uh, 
the country of Cyprus went through its bailout with the European Union. And there was all these talks about, were they going to leave the EU? Were they gonna go back to their own currency? And it was a moment of economic uncertainty. And Cypriots started buying Bitcoin during that time. And that was the first time Bitcoin made international headlines. Um, as someone in DC, um, I had a connection with the finance minister of Cyprus and I got to meet him and interview him and speak with him about the people buying Bitcoin. And it was one of the most, I think, important conversations for me, but also anybody else watching Bitcoin at that time, because it was the first time we actually saw people using this technology as an alternative monetary system and a moment where they thought maybe the system they were um, relying on wasn't gonna work for them or potentially could fail or um, you know, ha you know, seeing issues with it. And so that was the first time we saw Bitcoin have international headlines. And it was, to me, it really solidified what I believed about the importance of this technology. Were the citizens buying it or were, was the government buying it? Or the both? citizens, people. The yeah. citizens were. Yeah. And they were using it for commerce. Well, they were using it. They were, they, I don't know if they were using it, but they were just opting out of their currency. To so take their currency and store it in Bitcoin. And buying Bitcoin, right. yeah. yeah. It was a smart move back then. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen that over and over again. You know, we saw that with Venezuela. Um, in 2019, there was a story on the front page of the New York Times, and the title of the story was Bitcoin Saved My Family. And it was a story about uh, a family who um, was on the wrong side of the political regime and they needed to flee the country. Um, but they had sanctions on them and uh, the only way to get out of the country was to buy tickets with Bitcoin and they were able to get here to the States uh, to safety. We saw this in Canada with the truckers, right? You had all the, the whole trucker situation earlier this year where people were being cut off from their financial system and they started accepting crypto. We saw this in Ukraine. So just a couple months ago, um, there was a, a team of people from Ukraine that testified in the US Senate Banking Committee and they talked about how the country of Ukraine was able to raise over $100 million worth of crypto from the people around the world to help essentially crowdfund their um, defense system. So, so what's the current environment like? I mean, you if you were to pin them down, like. I mean, clearly they're letting things happen, but the SEC is not approving a, uh, an ETF yet that's a, ca a cash basis. What's the current environment like? Yeah, so, well, I wanted to directly answer your first question on like this question of banning okay. Bitcoin or banning crypto. So in 2013, that was when Congress was, was looking at what, what do we want to do with this technology? And there are three hearings on Capitol Hill that year. Um, I... Uh, watched all of them very closely. And uh, eventually they came to the conclusion that no, we're gonna allow this technology to move forward, but it needs to be regulated. And so that started a whole regulatory process and FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, was the first one to issue guidance. And so we started the chamber right after that to help be a part of that process. But there is no indication that Bitcoin uh, will be banned. That's not even the conversation in DC. Uh, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, testified in Congress uh, within the past year. He was asked this um, by uh, members of the House Financial Services Committee, and he said, no, there's no plans to do that. Chairman Gary Gensler was uh, asked this in his congressional testimony as well. He said, no, there's no plans to ban Bitcoin either. We, we're not doing that. Um, and then also Brian Brooks, when he was the head of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, he also testified in front of Congress saying there's absolutely no plans to ban Bitcoin. Yeah, I don't think you can put that genie back in the bottle anyways. It's out. It's out. And then also, you know, fundamentally, Bitcoin, it's, it's software. It's code. It's ones and zeros. And code is protected by free speech in the United States. So there's really no legal basis for that. So if anyone, you know, we, we do get that question a lot. Well, won't people just ban it? That's, that's really not the reality. I really meant, though, like, are. what was the conversation like early days to present about banning it? Like, are those people that are in Congress that wanted to do it, are they out? Are, are they, or is there, and it sounds like to me, you kind of answered the question by saying, well, there's no one that wants to do it now, right? There, there is, 
there's no interest in that. There's no, we have no indication that there's, you know, e e even it, the, the, the system, the, the situation we are in from a policy perspective is very different. You know, as you know, President Biden signed an executive order on digital assets uh, into law just a couple of months ago, um, which was really a watershed moment for our industry where the president said, this is one of the most important technologies we will see in the 21st century. And that EO, it sets, it directs the US federal government to ensure that the US is a leader in developing this technology. So I, I, you know, I think it's incredibly important just to recognize that we have support at the highest levels of our government to develop and innovate blockchains and digital assets here in the United States. Did you, uh... Did you see that Michael Saylor comment on using Satoshi to, uh, like a Satoshi to verify identity? Did you read that about Twitter? No, I didn't see oh, that. Oh, so he's suggesting instead of a blue tag, you get an orange oh, okay. tag if you're verified with a Satoshi? He would say that, yeah. Well, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> talking right? his book, yeah. Yeah, well, he is talking <laughs> his book for sure. Um, so obviously, we have an audience of individuals here, business owners. What do you, in, what would you say to them about the current state of regulation and what you think that someone like them can be doing to take advantage of Bitcoin right now? Okay, so one of the things that's really important to understand is that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies um, are not exactly the same thing. So Bitcoin is created through proof of work and it is the creation of digital property and it's very different than other cryptocurrencies like those that are running on proof of stake networks. And the way regulation ap applies to Bitcoin and applies to other cryptocurrencies are very different. On the other hand, there's a lot of uncertainty. Bitcoin, we know what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a commodity, is regulated under the Commodity Exchange Act by the CFTC, and there's no ambiguity around that. So for other cryptocurrencies, whether those are stable coins, whether those are smart contracts platforms, the gas that runs smart contracts platforms, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, mostly at the SEC. So I, you guys all listened to uh, Natalie Brunel this morning and, and you'll hear Greg Foss later, but I wanna emphasize this point to everybody, this is a learning experience that she just said something incredibly important and that is there's cryptocurrency and there's everything else around cryptocurrency and then there's only one Bitcoin, right? And I, I wonder, it, obviously education is the most important thing, but I don't know if people really get that, that there is only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. We know, how many do you think have been burned so far, like that are lost? There's, I know there's an estimate, but do you have any kind of line on that in terms of your research at all? No, I'm not sure how much is lost, but everyone that's lost, it just makes the ones that are still in circulation and still use that much So I've heard valuable. like four or five million kind of got lost because people lost their code in the early days. They're trading for pizzas and doing crazy things and their hard drives got, you know, thrown in the dump and all this other stuff. But there's only 21 million of them, whereas on the cryptocurrency side, maybe you could describe for people that, you know, what, what they can do to and, and have more of them and sort of why you think there's a big differentiation. Right, so Bitcoin has been described and compared to gold or digital gold or gold 2.0. So even Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed in his congressional testimony talking about Bitcoin, he has compared Bitcoin to gold. So has chairman Gary Gensler at the SEC. Um, and there was a, a, a report that was put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis in 2018 that said Bitcoin will emerge as its own asset class. It is a non-correlated asset and can be used will most, mostly be used for diversification purposes. So this is a really important point. When we think about how Bitcoin performs in a portfolio, and if you take a normal portfolio of stocks and bonds and add 2% of Bitcoin to a portfolio, what you find is that your returns go up your volatility goes down and that increases the sharp ratio. Mm. So when we talk about risk on, and I love that, that name mm. for your conference, yeah. I would actually make the case based on what we see on how Bitcoin is performing in the market, how it performs in an investment portfolio, 
um, that because it decreases the risk of a portfolio and because it uh, decreases the volatility in a portfolio, that this is one of the least risky moves you can make as an investor. And really what you're doing is it's an insurance policy. Just if, if something systemic fails, which we're certainly in an interesting time from an economic perspective this week, what we've seen in the markets since the Fed tightening has really started and seeing how everything's responded to that. Just if something fails that you know, we, we don't expect to fail, Bitcoin is your insurance policy. So if you only put one or 2% of your portfolio in it, what do you have to lose? Really I, I wonder uh, if we can get a show of hands, everyone in the audience that doesn't own Bitcoin, that you don't own any Bitcoin. Is that a major? I don't know. Is that a majority or a minority? It looks at least half. Half the people. At least half. Yeah. Don't own Bitcoin, right? What's the What's the statistics now in terms of what you What you think is happening in the industry in terms of you saw Fidelity say they're going to have available in their four hundred one k. Is this in your mind just a tidal wave that's just going to get bigger, or do you think that? that uh, the regulatory environment is going to push back and not let it continue to happen fast enough? I mean, wh what's the political horizon now? I see Biden saying, hey, I want you to study it. I want you to make it hap happen. Right. I want you to come back with the proper reporting and proper regulation. Do you, did you think it, any, in any way that was lip service to, the, to sort of one side of it? Or do you actually think that they're legitimately trying to come up with something that works? No, so from the EO, so we did quite a bit of work with this administration and the previous administration on this. We called for an executive order on digital assets. In 2019 at the chamber, we issued a national strategy for blockchain and the EO um, references uh, many of the recommendations that we put forward. So we do see this as something that's important. Um, and again, Bitcoin and all the other digital assets are very different. We have a lot of legal clarity when it comes to Bitcoin, when it comes to other cryptocurrencies like stable coins, proof of stake networks, and others. Uh, there's a lot of legal ambiguity and the regulatory, uh, we need a, a better regulatory process to bring clarity for companies that are building on those blockchains. When it comes to Bitcoin, um, the way we measure Bitcoin, it's, it's not a stock, it's not a security, it's not an equity, it's a commodity, but it's a network. It's a technology, it's a network. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we measure networks is very different than you measure companies or stocks or equities or bonds. So networks, the more people that use them, the more powerful they become. And we use an S-curve to measure technology adoption. You can run an S-curve on the adoption of any technology going back backwards, and the formula is always the same. And what the formula is, is the amount of time it takes a technology to go from zero to 10% adoption is the same amount of time it takes to go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption. So again, you can look back, whether that's email, computers, smartphones, the laptop, cars, whatever, it's all the same formula. But where is it on the curve? So on an S curve, on for Bitcoin, uh, we estimate we're about 25% adoption today. In 2019, this is based on many different surveys and studies that different groups have done, we were at about 10% adoption in 2019, which would put us at 90% adoption by 2029. So we're still at that lower half of the S-curve. We haven't yet reached the shakeout phase. Um, and this is uh, a... Um, a critical opportunity from an, from an investment perspective to be involved in this space. Once you hit 90% adoption, the investment opportunities go away, but you have mass adoption and penetration at that point in time. So this recent, um, for those of you who don't know, there's a stable coin called uh, Terra, Terra Luna, and the Bitcoin community was really excited because they were creating a stable coin and part of it was backed by Bitcoin. So they bought three and a half billion worth of Bitcoin. They were gonna buy 10 billion worth of Bitcoin. And the wheels came off, like, I mean, really came off yeah. pretty quickly. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that part in terms of, does that change things regulatory wise? I mean, it just happened. You saw them liquidate that Bitcoin to keep the peg. They lost the peg. It, 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 it you know, obviously, I think you saw 18 billion worth of liquidations total you could argue that that shows the strength of Bitcoin. Yeah, and once again, it also shows that Bitcoin is very different because it's 
proof of work than everything else, right? You can't just consider all cryptocurrencies equal because they're not. When it came to Luna, it's an algorithmic stable coin. Um, so in the stable coin space, there's, you also can't just say all stable coins are equal because there's many different types of stable coins. You have algorithmic coins that have you know, very complex formulas in terms of how they're pegged or backed. Um, and then you also have stable coins like USDC, which is backed one to one to the dollar, meaning for every USDC that's circulating, there is a dollar in a bank account that represents it. That's very different than an algorithmic stable coin. So um, Secretary Yellen led a whole policy report last year through the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, and they released a whole report of recommendations for regulations for stable coins. And this report, when it came out, was somewhat controversial for a number of reasons. But the scope of that report only applied to these one-to-one -one backed stable coins. It didn't include algorithmic stable coins. And so what was really interesting to me as someone working in the policy space was this week when Secretary Yellen came out and said, look at this Luna issue. This is why we need to implement our recommendations. But the recommendations wouldn't have, you know, were outside the scope of what this particular project was. But the so, process of it breaking, though, process of Luna and Terra breaking, same thing, right? Um, pointed out, though, that the system could absorb a break and that it wasn't one financial institution that was going to go down because everyone, I, I hope everyone gets this concept, like your wallets owning the Bitcoin were not an institution that was going to fail. Like I, uh, Sarai, my friend Sarai in the front row, she has Bitcoin, right? She has it in a wallet. She didn't have to worry her wallet would fail and her Bitcoin wouldn't be there. She didn't own it through Lehman Brothers. She owned it herself. It was her asset, right? So even though something that underlying held Bitcoin like Luna and they were liquidating it, it wasn't a run, quote, run on the institution. Absolutely not. And there were a lot of warnings before the DPEG happened. There were many people who went all over the internet and social media saying, this is relatively risky, this is leveraged, people investing in this really need to understand the risk uh, because this is not foolproof. And what do you know, those people were right and everything we saw this past week was incredibly predictable. So it's also important for people who are considering investing in the digital asset ecosystem to follow just the basic rules of investing, which is one, don't invest in things you don't understand, don't invest more than what you can afford to lose, and do, do your research. And for those who had done those three things, were protected throughout this depegging and the fallout of Luna. Unfortunately, there were a lot of people who were invested in this Luna project who lost their life savings. Um, it's been incredibly difficult to see people on Reddit and on Twitter calling out to, um, you know, in complete desperation because they, you know, <laughs> found themselves in an absolutely horrible situation. Sure. So this is a rather nascent industry, a ra rather nascent ecosystem. There absolutely are risks and we can't just forget the basic rules of how to engage from an investment perspective as it pertains to digital assets. So I want to go back to this comment earlier. I hope everyone followed this. So about this S curve, because this is for learning purposes. Everyone's here is to here to learn. So the S curve is the first 10% took how long? So it says a technology, the S curves are how you measure technology adoption. So the amount of time it takes a technology to go from 0% adoption to 10% adoption is the same amount of time it'll take to go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption. So when we measure Bitcoin on an S curve, it predicts that we will have 90% adoption by the year 2029. Right, but the, and so it took uh, effectively how long to get to 10%? So we were at 10% by 2019, so about 10 years. Okay. If Bitcoin was introduced in 2020. About 10 years, yeah. right. So if we're at 25 or so percent now, what you're telling the audience is effectively, we're to get to 10%, it's gonna to take to 20, or 90% to 2029, 
they still have a chance to be on that, that S curve of mass adoption. But when you get to 90%, the appreciation opportunity is probably gone. The investment opportunity, that's when Bitcoin truly operates as a stable store of value. So one of the biggest criticisms of Bitcoin is that it's volatile. The price is all over the place, which it is. But that's only because it's still nascent and it's still thinly traded. But once you have mass adoption, that volatility is going to go away. And for a guy like myself who runs a hedge fund and his entire business model is based on volatility, yeah. Bitcoin is a great asset, right? Because right now I was able to buy Bitcoin yesterday, the day before that, and the day before that for more than half of what it was just in November, but still um, probably when I first purchased a Bitcoin was $5. I got what the return from there to 29,000 would be. But if you think about the math, right, I'm still buying an asset that I knew was $5 and it's 29,000, but down from 69,000 when we were in Dubai, right? And so there's still an opportunity for people to enter if we believe this, that we're gonna to get to 90% adoption. So what I encourage people to focus on is not the price. I feel like a lot of times we're talking about what is the price of Bitcoin? Like it's all over the news. On CNBC, they have their little like price ticker. What we really should be asking ourselves is what is the value? Like we all, everybody knows what the price is, whatever it's trading for on the spot markets, but what, what is the value? What is it actually worth? So we have four different valuation models that we use to measure the value of the Bitcoin network. Um, we use stock to flow. We use stock to flow charted using the price of gold. We use a, a trend line analysis using the historical price of Bitcoin and then Metcalf's law. All four of those valuation models today have Bitcoin valued between forty-eight and one hundred and eighty thousand dollars each. And these models are 91 to 99 percent correlated to the 12 year historical price of Bitcoin. So these are valuation models. They're used largely by many different private equity funds and hedge funds that are investing in Bitcoin and digital assets today. But that's the secret is understanding not just what, what the price, what it's trading for, but what is the value of the network? You have like one place if you were you've seen because you obviously work in the industry in terms of knowing all the exchanges sort of the best place to buy crypto, to store it, to own it. And I know this is a big, it's a big ask of you because you run a, an association which you probably don't want to upset everybody. So uh, where would you tell people to go buy Bitcoin at? Yeah, so I don't, I don't endorse any products or services um, in this space, but the way you buy Bitcoin and digital currencies is a little bit different than going through your brokerage because the brokerages largely are not offering services and digital assets today, but they will, they will soon. But again, we're still in that early phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so Fidelity is one place we do represent Fidelity. They're a member of the chamber. Um, you do have to be an, an, uh, an accredited investor to use Fidelity. And I think they have a $1 million minimum. Um, and I think they charge around a 2% fee, mm. um, but you can buy directly from Fidelity and they will c custody it for you. And really the, the huge benefit of Fidelity providing these services is it's backed by the institution of Fidelity, who we all know and trust. Yeah, I, I happen to know an institution, Ernity. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. No, I haven't heard um, of them. There you go. And- uh, They got their fan club here, okay. Yeah, uh, Ernity.com. <laughs> and the difference between Ernity is they have a trust. So when you buy your Bitcoin, it goes into a trust. It's not on their balance sheet. So if Ernity disappears, your Bitcoin is still in trust. So that's one thing that you could go. That was a self-loaded question. I think that was terrible of me. Maybe I should be, I, I, yeah, I could be interviewing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that was terrible of me. Um, so, if you had a magic wand and you could just say, here's all the regulation I want right now. You can make it all happen. Is what's like the highest point of your agenda right now? So we would love to see a spot Bitcoin ETF. I think it's truly a failure of the SEC that we don't have one today trading in the United States. There are spot Bitcoin ETFs in many other nations around the world. So we're truly behind the ball here. But what's really atrocious about this is that accredited investors and non-accredited investors do not have access to the same products in the public markets for securitized Bitcoin products where accredited investors are getting access to closed end mutual funds at NAV and not accredited investors only have access to what's trading on the public markets. So, so yeah, so I happen to have created a, a second market exchange many years ago 
and a colleague of mine created what they know as grayscale today. Yeah. Um, there you go. And if you don't know what Grayscale is, it is a company on the OTC uh, that is a trust that sort of used the rules the right way to get it done, but effectively trades at a big discount, net asset value discount to what the underlying Bitcoin's worth. So that means the stock of Grayscale, all they do is own Bitcoin, but it's the, the actual underlying trust that owns the Bitcoin their stock is trading at, I think, a pretty big discount. It's over 30% today. Yeah, to that, right? So you, there's been recent talk, and Grayscale said, hey, we think we can get something done by you. Maybe they're just job owning, but if, if you were to handicap it, is Grayscale the first one to get approved? I can't speculate on that. <laughs> uh, they're see, obviously... See, none of you out there know that, that, that that's a shot. I mean, that, that would be... If you said that, you know that I'd put that out there tomorrow. They're right? obviously the gorilla in the room. Um, yeah. But there's well over a dozen issuers who have tried to get a spot Bitcoin ETF through the SEC process. So what gray, the, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is, it is, is a closed-in mutual fund. So what we want is an open-ended mutual fund, which is, is an ETF, meaning you can redeem out of that fund. And they have stated that they have a process underway to open it up, and they're pushing really hard to get that turned into um, an ETF. But look, at the SEC, I mean, this truly is... Um, it's easy to kind of poke the SEC in the eye here, but they've really failed us because they are acting as a, uh, they're picking winners and losers. They're holding this industry to a different standard. And even the commissioners at the SEC do not agree on how the commission is handling Bitcoin as an asset class. Uh, Commissioner Hester Purse has dissented against uh, the disapproval or the, the um, uh, the process being roadblocked at the SEC of getting uh, a Bitcoin spot um, ETF through the process. So they're holding this industry to a higher standard. They're picking winners and losers when they're, by Congress, designated to be a disclosure regulator. They're not meant to pick who they want. If you follow the process, you have the right disclosures, you should be able to get to market. So this is something we've spent a lot of time thinking about at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Uh, we represent many of these issuers. We're in the process of really interviewing them and understanding them with our legal counsel about what roadblocks they're seeing. Um, and we plan on taking this to Congress. We think this is an oversight issue. Um, and we are looking for Congress to provide some heat on the SEC and to open up some more transparency about what's actually happening because today there is no good reason not to have one. So we will have one. I am very optimistic that we will have one soon. Unfortunately, it may take Congress getting involved. So that was like a minute and a half or two minutes of like great content, like <laughs> really great shit. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, I can tell you, uh, I didn't say anything about the SEC, <laughs> but you did. We can keep going. We can talk about the IRS next. They're, they're my next target. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 the SEC and I are fine right now. So I'll just, I'm good. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> I'm not a lobbyist or anything like that. Um, well, I mean, I think actually, I actually think, I think that that's a turning point, right? When that cash ETF gets approved, the ability for everyone to have it in their TD Ameritrade account for them to build. Yeah, it's a game changer. There's so much pent up demand for Bitcoin because like I said, through the brokerage, most of them are not offering any types of products and services. There's tens of trillions of dollars managed through brokerage accounts, right? So most people like they just use their broker. That's how they make investments. They all, they go to you know, their advisor, everything's managed there. They don't want to leave the brokerage to go open an account on, you know, Coinbase or River or whatever the other one was. You, met, you know, they don't want to- Earnity. Earnity. Um, most people, they just, they, you know, tens of trillions of dollars is managed through this process. And right. so for people who own Bitcoin today, what they have to do is they have to leave that process, go open an account through a separate trading platform that specializes in digital assets. Um, so there's a lot of pent up demand for it. If once we do get approved a spot Bitcoin ETF, all those um, funds sitting through the brokerage will now be able to invest um, in a securitized Bitcoin 
product. And I think that's, that'll be a moon opportunity for Bitcoin. And that potentially is why the SEC has been, has been such a blocker, because they know it's going to create um, a whole new market for Bitcoin, and perhaps they don't want to see that happen. Is Roland here? Well, we got uh, any uh, mics? We're going to see if we have any questions from the audience for you. You don't mind doing that, do you? Yeah, absolutely. So in D.C., in you, is, your, is your lobbying effort or your effort for your clients, the people that are a member of e-commerce, is because there's been obviously a certain amount of adoption, is it pretty easy to get people's ears now? I mean, are they, are people, the ones that you want to listen to you listening to you? Or are there still out there a few people? I mean, what, what I'm really asking is Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> um, yeah, I figured that was coming, right? Uh, what does she want to happen? I mean, because what I, I've had, I have a friend of mine in the securities business who will remain nameless is over there. <laughs> and she has demonized this industry so bad. Yeah, it's been disappointing. And what is it you think that she as a senator is looking for us to do? What, what regulatory environment is she looking for versus other uh, members of Congress and Senate? What, what, where do you think she let, falls down in terms of regulation? Yeah, so Senator Elizabeth Warren, who I have great respect for, I think she's just wrong when it comes to crypto, um, she has been very vocal. She's on the Senate Banking Committee, and there's been a num number of hearings about digital assets in Senate banking, and she's taken that as an opportunity to um, uh, really just talk about all the concerns she has. Um, to me, it really doesn't make sense because Senator Warren has spent her entire political career fighting against the big banks and fighting for the retail consumer. She was really the architect of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, so I, I, I think our biggest tool, I strongly believe this, that our biggest tool today in terms of educating not only our policymakers, but everybody else, is education. I think she just hasn't understood how this technology, how Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really are a, a, a huge empowerment for the retail consumer because for the first time they have access to a digital bear instrument. They can be their own bank. They no longer have to rely on a third party to hold and secure their assets and to facilitate transactions. We can have peer-to-peer -peer digital transactions for the first time in history because of the technology uh, that Bitcoin is. So and that the implications for consumers and for financial inclusion are are greatly misunderstood and there's a lot of potential there. So I think our biggest challenge that we have working with public policymakers is for those who either don't who have concerns or are pushing back, it comes from a place of fear of the unknown. It's not necessarily coming from a place of being informed. It's oh well, you know, I saw in the media that people invested in Terra and they lost their life savings, so maybe we should do something about it. But there's more to it, right? You, once you get below the headlines and once you have the opportunity to really understand this from a technology perspective, it's really hard to be against it. So I'll just share a quote from one of my board members who um, came from the Department of Justice and he said, I've met a lot of Bitcoin skeptics and I've also met a lot of people who know a lot about Bitcoin, but I've never met anyone who knows a lot about Bitcoin and is a skeptic. And that's really emblematic of the educational challenges that we face today. Um, when I was 11 years old or so, I wrote to Warren Buffett, actually called his office. Want, you know, uh, I saw him on CNN when I was young and my mom finally got a cable box with like, you guys, none of you probably remember this unless you're old like I am there was a cable box with like uh, 13 channels on it and a cord connected to the table. And instead of getting up and turning the channel, you could just press one of the channels and one of them was CNN. And uh, I admire the guy. And in fact, I, if I would have listened to him a lot sooner ago, I, I would have done better than I have today and probably avoided that problem I had in 2009. But the elephant in the room is that Charlie Munger and of course, Warren Buffett's quote that if I wouldn't spend 25 bucks on all the Bitcoin, 
what in the hell is the, is the problem with those guys? So I watched the um, Berkshire Hathaway, the part of the meeting where they talked about Bitcoin, I guess, two weeks oh, ago. I want you to know I watched every minute of it. <laughs> I couldn't. And, I don't and, have the patience for the whole thing. And I cringe <laughs> when I saw the Bitcoin part. Yeah, well, it, it's also very emblematic that they don't understand it. Um, so, you, again, you can't compare Bitcoin to a stock because it's not a security. Bitcoin is not a company. It's a network. So I think there are some more things going on um, at Berkshire Hathaway. So a big part of it is that over 20 percent of Berkshire Hathaway's holdings are in the legacy financial system. Bank of America, credit card companies, the payment processing companies. These are all the institutions that Bitcoin and blockchain technology are going to completely disrupt. So they also own very large positions. They own 10% of Bank of America. So they can't li really liquidate their positions um, without being front run by the market. Because once they start selling, everyone else is going to start selling. 18% of the American Express. Yeah. So they're locked up in, in the legacy financial system. And this is the same problem Berkshire Hathaway ha had during the internet. Warren Buffett completely missed the internet. He missed it. He completely missed it. He did the same thing. He was invested in all these legacy media companies. He was invested in encyclopedia companies. By the way, and his friend uh, Bill Gates gave away free encyclopedia ROM, right? Yeah. And wiped out a $50, $50 million a year EBITDA business that wouldn't convert to CD-ROM. Yeah. Right. All right. So you remember. So in the early 90s. Oh, I remember. Berkshire Hathaway was heavily invested in the legacy media company. The internet came out. And what did he start doing? He started doubling down because these companies that he was invested in, in the legacy media company, which the internet completely disrupted, their stock started going down. And he thought he was getting a deal, so he started buying more of it, only to find that that entire industry was being disrupted. So he, this is his second go around of completely discounting disruptive technology. But he was a paper boy, so newspapers made sense, right? Well, I, I mean, I, I certainly can understand the generational issues, but Warren Buffett said it himself when he, he, he said he was a complete idiot for missing Amazon. Those were his words. It was just out of pure stupidity that he missed it. He, has the, he had the opportunity to invest incredibly early days, and now he's one of the biggest investors in Apple. Well, he didn't invest in Apple until the iPhone had already hit mass adoption. Mm -hmm. So again, here we are. Remember, we talked about the S-curve. So um, you know, the S-curve, it, it, it applied to, to smartphone adoption. He bought at 90% adoption. He missed the whole... <laughs> the biggest opportunity from, from, an, investment, from an investment perspective. Um, and what happened in, in the 90s? Well, there, there were a lot of losses they had to take. So we're seeing that cycle again. And I think he's not, I have a ton of respect for Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. They are some of the best you know, uh, hedge fund managers of all time. Um, and I don't think they're stupid. I, I think they know the situation they're in, but they really are in between a rock and a hard place again because they're so, they have such huge so You think they're talking on. their book? The, well, they, they are talking their book. They absolutely are. So talking your book means that like, you are invested in one place. Like you're Michael Saylor, you're all in on Bitcoin. So you're, of course, going to say Bitcoin is the greatest thing ever and everyone should own Bitcoin and they'll cure cancer and shove Bitcoin up your ass and you won't have a hemorrhoid. Um, Roland, any questions about uh, for Perry Ann before we uh, move on? Anybody have a question about Bitcoin? You guys are a lively crowd about Bitcoin. Oh, there you go. We got one here. No, you got a question? Oh, hold on. Roland's coming to ask. Give you the mic. I wanted to ask: um, when it comes to women and Bitcoin, is there more women coming into the industry? And what do you recommend as teaching our children and young? Yeah, so when I first got started in this space almost a decade ago, um, it was estimated that it was about 9% female people working in the industry. Um, hopefully that number's increased. I, I, I think it has, but you, it, I mean, the cryptocurrency space, it's the tech industry and it's the finance industry kind of coming together. And these are two very much male dominated industries. So there absolutely is gender disparity throughout the cryptocurrency space, but there are a lot of amazing women who are working throughout crypto. So um, for other women who want to get involved in this space, um, there's a lot of great people who are you know, very interested in you know, bringing others in with open arms. So one of the things that I like about uh, Nicole Arbor and, and, and Perianne is 
this is a more complicated topic, but they're, they're mostly male dominated financial situations. My husband handles the money, although women make most of the buying decisions. There is a, a big uh, vacuum of women not being empowered financially. And, uh, and I've done a lot of podcasting on this. Uh, women are able to set up their own wallet and they should learn about it. There's a lot of education out there. And it's definitely a way of being empowered and controlling some of your own finance. Everyone, Perry Ann Boring, thank you so much. Thank you. Whoa, 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 what, what, what did I miss? I'm sorry. What did I miss? What did I miss? Hold on a second. No, I'm going to ask the question. What is it? Oh, okay. wait, whoa, whoa. Everybody, Eric Fleshy. Uh, so in terms of your uh, statement that there's Bitcoin and then everything else in virtual currency, uh, would you also put Ethereum in the same category as Bitcoin in terms of regulation? Great question. So Ethereum is also a commodity. Um, so both the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, have stated that ETH is a commodity, thus is regulated by the CFTC. So we do have uh, some, you know, a, a, we have additional certainty for Ethereum. From a technology, they're not the same. Ethereum is a smart contracts platform. It's a place to build decentralized applications. Bitcoin is a store of value. It's digital gold. So what you use Bitcoin for and what you use Ethereum for are two completely different applications. Well, how many uh, Ethereum could there be ever? I don't think there's a cap on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's only one Bitcoin, everybody. There's only one Bitcoin. Get it in the head. Everybody has to, you got to make sure you pay attention to this. There's only one Bitcoin. I'm an evangelist now. I've, I have went down the rabbit hole. Uh, our race car next year is orange. The Indy 500 is orange. We have the Bitcoin racing team. We're all in on this. Everyone, Perry and Boring. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great job. Thanks for watching. Risk on, everybody.